Hi, Kevin with Springfield Leather. We're going to do a short uh, video on basket weave stamping, stamping with the basket tools. Uh, this is basically for someone that has never used a basket weave tool or perhaps has a few problems with it or maybe someone that just wants to try it but doesn't quite know how to get going. First thing we're going to do is get our leather wet. And if you're going to do this, by the way, you really should use pretty decent leather. Anytime you're stamping or tooling on leather, the leather itself that you're using just makes a big difference. We're going to let that soak in for a moment. The first example we're going to do, uh, we're going to pretend that we're doing a belt. And I've got a little tool called a wing divider. Now if you want, open it up to whatever distance you want. We're going to scribe a very light line down both edges and we're going to scribe a line down the middle. How do you find the middle, you ask? You hunt for it, I said. Now you can measure, you can get your little ruler out and do all that stuff and that's fine. I've done this before so I'm not going to do that. But you can see we've got our little border lines and a center line. Next, I'm going to take a basket weave tool. This is an X513 in case you're wondering. And I'm going to stamp it right on one side of that line. Then I'm going to turn my leather around. Now here's the, here's the key part. When you're using this basket weave tool, a lot of people will just put one end of the stamp up against the other end, but that's not the way it works. What you do is you stick the foot of that tool right inside the other impression so it actually overlaps. Now, you have to turn the leather around quite a bit on this first, uh, first pass. Make sure you keep that tool all the way inside the last impression Make sure you keep it lined up straight with the line that you drew down the middle. Boy, it's always nice working with uh, Herman Oak leather. Man, it just makes wonderful impressions. Now you can see how the end of that tool fit right inside the last impression. Now, if you make a mistake and you get a little bit off, don't worry about it. You can kind of fix that as you go along. You just need to fix it as soon as you notice. Now, next, both of those feet right inside the last ones. And now you don't have to uh, turn your leather. Now we're going to turn it around and go down the other side. Same way. Keep that tool. So it goes right inside the last impressions. Now, let's do this one too. As we go along here, you'll notice I just started with a line that was approximately in the middle. It wasn't perfect. It doesn't have to be. We're, we're getting up close now to the edge of our belt. So what do we do? Well, we're going to stamp this time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lean this tool back towards me a little bit. Just a little. It won't leave quite as deep of an impression right up near the border. I'm going to show you several options here. Okay, that's what we have so far. Now, if you want to, you can take your swivel knife, which I'm going to do, and sharpen mine. And I'm going to go ahead and cut this border. both of them.
Then I'm going to take a beveling tool, if I can find one, and I'm going to bevel it. Right down the edge. I'm not worried about being uh, overly perfect on this because of a certain step that we're going to take. So we'll get it beveled all the way down there. And then we're going to just repeat the same thing that we did a minute ago. We're going to take Stamp both sides of the center line. And I'll tell you, getting in a hurry when you're basket stamping is not a happy deal. It just doesn't work out so great especially when you use the small basket weave stamps. My goodness, you have got to be a serious glutton for punishment when you're using those small basket weave tools. Some folks love them. I gotta say, they look really good. And boy are they a pain and well they're a pain. Okay, you see what we have this one we've gone all the way across. I'm going to take a border stamp. This is just a little camouflage tool and right on that line I'm going to tip the tool towards me and I'm going to stamp that border in there right over the top of some of those stamped basket weave impressions. And I'm going to keep going. Turn it around. We're going to do the other side. When you use a camouflage tool like this, and you're going to do a basket weave border, it's kind of a handy little tip if you'll if you'll put the toe of the tool inside the toe impression that you just made. In other words, don't stamp the tool so that it's right next to one another. Stamp it so that it's right inside, barely inside the last place that you stamped. We're just going to go right across here for a little bit. Okay. Now this is the part we're concerned with. Look at that. Even though we stamped over some of the, the impressions, it looks like it was made that way. Looks like that was the way it was intended to be, and it looks good. If you're a perfectionist, you can measure a little more closely than I did, and you won't have that issue. I'm not a perfectionist, if you don't know that by now. Now, this one here, you'll notice, this tool doesn't come quite far enough up to cover. There's a little space in there. And I just I just don't like that. So I'm going to take a different basket weave tool, or I'm sorry, a different camouflage tool, and I'm going to do the same thing. We're just going to, in the same fashion, go right across the border. And this is going to give it that finished look. I hope. There we are. Better. There's a lot of different ways you can use a basket weave tool. A lot of different ways. So don't hesitate to experiment. You can slant this thing. Uh, you can make V's out of the tool design. You can just do a lot. 
this is just a simple way for you to start. Okay, now one more thing. We're going to take another piece of leather. This time we'll take a little bigger one. Going to get it wet. And we're going to let it sit there just a minute. This time we're going to take our wing divider and I'm going to open it up here oh, about like such. Make a happy little line down there. Make another happy little line there. If you want to, you can cut that line, you can bevel it, you can do whatever you want. But the main purpose of this tool is to show you what an X507 will do. This is a true basket stamp. This makes the dumb thing look like somebody wove a basket. We're going to put it right in the corner. And we're going to turn it just like that. Then we're going to turn it back. You probably get the idea. Really makes a nice little woven pattern. Now, we're just going to go right down one side. You have to turn it every time and follow that line. With this tool, you just have to be reasonably careful. The biggest thing with this tool is the fact that it's okay to overlap the stamps just a little, but it's not okay to have a space between them. So we'll just go straight across and we'll maybe make one more pass so that you can really see the full effect. And as you go, it's helpful if you try to concentrate on keeping the tool itself straight. And by this I mean don't do don't do this. I don't know if you can see how much I turned it, but that's not good. Keep it straight in relationship to the other stamped impressions and you'll do just fine. What a lovely basket stamp. There you go. You could cut that out and wrap it around a, a soda can holder or something and tell people you wove it. Happy basket weaving. Hi, Kevin with Springfield Leather. We wanted to do just a short little how-to tip video on how to use a really, really common leather working tool. You probably recognize it. It's called a bone folder. You know, there's a lot of people out there that don't even know that this tool comes apart. It's kind of handy to know if you don't know that. But a bone folder does several things. The big pointy end here I'm really not going to tell you too much about because you probably know how to use that already. It's used to form leather used to mold it uh, like you'd mold a holster or a knife sheet. does a good job with that. But, this, but the rest of it has some interesting functions and I'll show you. First thing I'm going to do, take an edger, and cut the corner off of the, this little piece of leather. I get my highly technical, super extra expensive dollar general sponge wet. And I'm going to wet the edge of this leather. It's just a natural piece, hasn't been stamped or tooled or anything, but I got the edge pretty wet. A lot of crafters, especially hobbyists, they don't have the machinery it takes to professionally put an edge on a piece of leather, so they'll make their belt and they'll use one of those little circle things to edge it with, and that works fine, but you can also use a bone folder like this. Well, 
as the leather, when you've got the right amount of water in the leather, and you rub that edge, and you put a lot of friction on it, you really get a pretty darn good burnish. That's one way. It's actually faster than that little circle, unless, of course, you've got the circle in your battery-powered drill. With some leathers that maybe aren't quite as thick as this piece of 8 to 9 or 9 to 10, we're going to take the edge off again. And again, get it wet. This time, uh, the end of this little tool has some grooves in it. And most people probably already know or can figure out that you can take the proper size groove and you can run that back and forth just like that little circle edge slicker that some people use. And that puts a really nice burnish on your leather. Makes it look really good. But the thing that a lot of people aren't aware of about a bone folder is some of the other things that it'll do. So I'm going to get this little piece of leather wet. And maybe we'll get this one wet too. And I'll show you. Those little grooves are graduated steps. Here's one thing that you can do with them. It's pretty hard to make a border that's that nice, but that bone folder will just do it slick as all get out in just a minute. If you want a wider border, now we've actually got a, a wider border that looks like a double a double bladed swivel knife. Now that's pretty cool. We can take another one and this one will actually give you a really nice wider border. Now, for what it's worth, you can also substitute this for a stitching groover. If you need to make a, a groove to lay some stitches in, you can use any one of these little edges that you want and just make that little groove, poke your holes, and you're good to go. That's some handy things to know about a bone folder. Happy days. Hope you're smarter. I'm Kevin with Springfield Leather. You know, one of the most difficult things that people have trouble with when they're trying to do western floral carving is decorative cuts. And decorative cuts, they're just the hardest part of it. So I thought I'd take a few minutes today and show you just a couple of tricks that will really help you a lot if you're having a little trouble with your decorative cuts. Okay, first of all, leather, water. Believe it or not, when you're making decorative cuts, usually at that time you've got your pattern pretty well tooled, but you still have to have the right amount of water in the leather for your knife to be able to work happily. Now, I got a nice piece of Herman Oak leather here and I'm getting it pretty darn wet. And if I'm going to be doing Western floral style carving on leather, I really want it to be Herman Oak. I'm a little bit prejudiced. But I've been carving leather for a lot of years, and I know the difference between a good carving leather and a carving leather that's not so good. So that's why I like to use this. Now, as you can see, uh, after the leather was wet, and it was wet pretty good, it's starting to return to its natural color. That's what I want. It's, it's ready to make those cuts. So. If you can, in your project, 
while you're working on your project, you need to make sure that your leather still has the right amount of water in it. And that does take some ex experimentation, but you'll, you'll quickly see what the right amount of moisture is. First thing I'm going to do is take a little scrap piece of leather, rub some jeweler's rouge into it, and I'm going to make my, my swivel knife blade nice and polished. That's essential. You cannot do good decorative cuts, or even any cutting with a swivel knife, unless your knife blade is polished. It's not critical that it be razor sharp. I mean, it's knife, nice if it's sharp, but it needs to be polished. So strop it, and you can see it turns the, the jeweler's rouge on this piece of leather black. That's because it's removing metal. Okay, now, decorative cuts. This is how it's supposed to work. Now, that's really simple. One of the big tricks with decorative cuts is to keep them simple. As your skill improves, you can go ahead and complicate your cuts a little bit. And it doesn't take very long to really get pretty good with this little swivel knife. But there's a couple of things that you absolutely have to remember. First of all, it is mandatory, like I said, that that swivel knife be sharp. Now, in case you haven't figured it out yet, I'll tell you again. Your swivel knife has to be sharp. You probably get the idea. Sharpness is not an option here. It's got to be polished. Polished. Polished so that it's slick and slides through the leather. Okay, moisture content. You'll get the hang of that. Now, the trick about these decorative cuts is this. I'm going to make a couple of lines here with the swivel knife that are not related to these cuts, but you'll see what I'm talking about. Do you notice how all the cuts come down towards the point of that upside down triangle? That's what decorative cuts have to do. Now if you have a, a western floral pattern, then you have to decide where you want those cuts to come down to. As a, for instance, we'll take a little, just, just a little bit of a freehand pattern here. This is not, again, not complicated. That's just a simple little leaf and a scroll. What we want are decorative cuts that flow with that pattern. I'll show you a right way and a wrong way. Now, as we go about this, when you start a decorative cut, normally, you want your knife blade to be crosswise in front of you. Maybe not quite perfectly crosswise, but kind of sort of crossways in front of you, not facing you uh, vertically. You want it horizontally in front of you. The reason for that is when you make a decorative cut, you need to turn the swivel knife blade almost immediately. That's what gives us the cuts like we made over here. That blade was turned immediately. So we're going to put some little cuts in here and just watch. I'm starting that blade. You can see I push down, turn it, pull it towards me, and ease off the pressure. I'm gonna, this one, I'm going to have just, this one's going to not be so horizontal. It's going to face me a little bit, and I'm going to turn it, follow the swivel cut, There's the two cuts that I just did. Now, notice the ends of the cut, they all point in the same direction. They point down to here. 
That's really important when you're making decorative cuts. They all need to point towards the same place. I'm going to make a few more. And you'll start to see how this works. Decorative cuts don't have to be long and fancy. Starting with it crosswise in front of me, turning it around, digging it in, picking up the pressure, easing off several times. Now, look at the cuts in those leaves. They all have one thing in common. They come down to that point your pattern. Whatever pattern that you're making, that's what you need to do. Ensure that those cuts come down to that focal point. And once you, and, and by the way, I got to tell you, this is tons easier on a good piece of leather than it is on a piece of leather that's not so good. I don't want this to sound like a big sales pitch, and, and maybe it does. But if you have never carved on leather, such as Herman Oak, or perhaps Wicked and Craig, you really can't appreciate the difference in the way your swivel knife works. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to go a little further, just see what happens. By the way, there's no rules when it comes to making decorative cuts other than the fact that they should flow and they should all come down to that point like we talked about. We're just making some very, very small cuts. Now some people would perhaps use an angle blade to make decorative cuts. I don't do that. I use a flat one. The reason I use a, a flat blade is because I'm lazy. It has, count them, one, two corners. So when one corner gets dull, you turn it around and you use the other one. Now you're still going to have to sharpen this thing every few minutes, so don't hesitate. And by the way, this is one of the things that will enable you to tell the difference between a really good piece of leather and a piece of leather that's not so good. If you've got your knife sharp and your knife kind of does this number, then you know that leather is just not the best leather that it could be. So, good piece of leather helps incredibly. And if you make a mistake, you can probably fix it. That's a good thing. Now look at all the happy little cuts. They're just little. They're small. They're simple. That's what you want to keep in mind when you're making decorative cuts. Keep them small, simple, and above all, ease off the pressure when the cut comes to an end. Gradually ease it off. Don't just stop. Here's what it looks like when you make a cut and all of a sudden you just stop. Look at this. What a difference between that and this. Look how nice that is. This one flows, this one just stops dead. I'm going to show you what happens when you don't keep those cuts coming down to a focal point. We're going to take that nice looking cut. You see, that's what happens right there to a lot of folks. They're 
making those swivel cuts and they forget to bring them all down to a point. And this is true on any floral carving pattern that you do. Now if you're working on an oak leaf, all those cuts go towards the center of the leaf. Any kind of a leaf, cuts go towards the center of the leaf. Now there's times, like I said, when you make a mistake and you could probably fix things like this, but you have to fix them in such a way Believe me, sometimes it's a little easier to... do them right in the first place. than it is to fix something. Now, I don't know how much fixing that is. You can decide. but it's at least better. There's a, a ton of exercises that you can do with a swivel knife to teach yourself to make decorative cuts. You can read books. You can get good leather. You can keep your knife sharp. But the biggest thing is to keep those cuts coming down in a focal point. You Once you have a western floral pattern on your leather, You can do so many things just by keeping that knife sharp, short cuts, make your cuts simple. You can add to your design for days and days, and days. Little accents make big differences. So there you go. Keep your swivel knife sharp. Keep it polished regularly. Jeweler's Rouge costs a couple bucks. You can get enough for that much money to last your lifetime probably. Now if you drop the dumb knife, then you're going to have to take that nick out and so you'll need a stone or whatever but you can repolish it. When you make a decorative cut start with firm pressure and then ease up as you slowly pull it out of the leather as you glide it right back towards yourself. Keep the cuts coming down to a focal point and that applies to inside of flowers, leaves and everything. Practice with some border cuts. You can. Decorative cuts don't have to be restricted to the inside of a pattern. Look at the outside. You can do all kinds of neat stuff. So there's a couple tips and hints. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kevin with Springfield Leather. I have had recently several people ask me how to use this happy little gadget. It's called a lace maker. A lace maker is a really cool tool. Howsomever, it can be a really frustrating tool if you don't know how to use it. So I thought we'd do this brief little tutorial. First of all, a lace maker will only work with a sharp blade. If for any reason you've gotten your blade dull, you, you might as well just forget it. It's done. You need to replace the blade. and That's not a big deal. It's easy enough. Just replace it and then you'll be good to go. Also, a lace maker is designed to work on relatively firm leather. Now, they can be thin leather, they just need to be firm, have some body. Now, when you get really good with this, you can cut soft, mushy leather. I can cut deerskin with it, but it is more difficult, and you really need to have some practice under your belt before you try that. So, first of all, I'm going to take a little piece of scrap leather that I happen to come by from the Justin Boot Company. I've cut myself a little, little piece of leather here and I'm going to take my shears and I'm going to cut a hole approximately in the center of it. Now you can take a round drive punch. That's a lot easier. Just bonk. Make yourself a nice round little hole. And that works quite well. 
I've been cutting lace with a lace maker for so many years I can't even think about it. If you're right-handed, you hold the lace maker in your right hand and you keep the sharp point of the blade out in front of you, pointing away from you. you put it through the hole in your leather. And at this point, again, you want that blade facing straight away from you. The sharp point needs to be going away from you. Then you give it a push. You hold your leather firmly with your left hand. You give it a push and a twist. Just a little one. Watch. There. Not much. Now. I can see a little tail just starting to appear. So I'm going to give it another little bitty push and a twist. And there it is. Don't know if you can see that down in there. It's kind of hard to see. But that little tail is there. So I'm going to work my fingers in there. You can see it's sticking up now maybe. I'm going to grab a hold of that tail and just, just start to work it a little bit. When you're doing that, you need to keep this finger of your left hand up underneath this leather. If you didn't notice, when we started this lace maker, we started it like this, right-handed. Give it that little twist. Now once you've got that tail out there, you switch hands. Very important. Then you get a hold of that little tail and you start to work it through or you break it off, whatever the case, and you start to pull it around through there. It just takes a, a little bit of working with your fingers until it sticks out and then you can pull it and the next thing you know you're making lace. Now if you pull too fast it's not going to work at all. So just take it nice and slow and we're making some lace here that's probably oh looks to me like about an eighth of an inch wide and from that little four inch circle we've got I don't know maybe 10-12 feet of lace. I'm going to do this once again, just so that you can see. Except this time I'm going to make wider lace. I want to take my thumbnail and I'm going to push this ring, this retaining ring, off the lace maker. I'm going to pull the blade out. I'm going to slide it over into the next slot. I'll tap it with my scissors here a little bit get the blade back in there and I'm going to put this little retaining ring on there again sliding it down onto that plastic and working working my way around it'll go gradually which is a good thing until it's holding the blade in this time we're going to make wider lace I'll try another piece of leather This is another little boot scrap. I'm kind of going to fold it over. I'm going to cut my little circle right in the middle of it. Take my right hand. The blade is pointing away from me. I'm going to put it in that hole. I'm going to hang on to this with my left hand. I'm going to give it a little push and a twist. And there's that tail. I'm going to switch hands now, just like you saw me do. I'm using my left hand on the lace maker. Grab a hold of that little tail and start turning it around. And this time we're making wider lace. This would make great buck stitch lacing for a pillow, maybe a handbag, home decor item, something like that. You won't get quite as much lace out of the piece, but you get quite a bit. Makes really good lace. Now. If you want to cut thin leather, you can do that. But first, you got to have a hole in it. If your leather is firm, now this is about two ounce leather, maybe two and a half at the most. If it's firm, push it away, give it a twist. You might have to give it two twists 
until that little tail appears, hold your finger up underneath that leather. Grab the tail, and even if you have to grab this outer piece of leather at the same time, that's fine. Do that until you can work it around. Now, one thing you need to take note of. If you've got a thin piece of leather and you're cutting on the, the top slot, it means you've got quite a bit of space in there between the leather and the top of the lace maker. If you're not careful, the leather will bunch up in there and it's hard to cut lace that way. That's why you use this first finger to keep the leather pushed up against the top of the lace maker. You push it up there just enough to keep it firm and then you can pull it through. Now if you want you can cut a larger piece. Size really doesn't matter too much except when you get above a square foot. A lace maker really is not very happy if you cut a piece of leather that's over a square foot. And with pieces that are larger, there's a few little tricks. We're going to cut our hole and start it just like always. Give it a little push and a twist. We're going to switch. We're going to switch hands. Grab that little tail and the piece of leather all at the same time. We're going to start to push. Now sometimes your leather, because of drooping down, will not pull through so easily. So what you need to do is you might have to give it a little flop, give it a little flip, all the while using that, that finger of your left hand to hold the leather up against the inside top of the lace maker. And if it, here we go. Another thing is that if, if you pull too fast, you'll burn your finger. And if you make too much lace too fast, you'll also start to melt a slot in that little lace maker. And that's not a good thing. To stop it, that's all there is to it. Now, for what it's worth, as I mentioned before, you can cut soft leather with this. But that little trick of the flapping really comes into play. So learn to cut some stiff leather first, uh, various kinds. Once you get that down, you'll understand and you'll do pretty good. Happy lace making. Hello. I have a happy little, little wizard border tool in my hand. I just got asked how this worked, so I thought I'd show you. It works with a swivel knife. And one thing you have to know is it only works with this particular blade. That's the big wide one that comes standard with most swivel knives. All you do is take the little screw on the end and loosen it until you get to a point where this little swivel knife will stick down in there. And this little collar on the the little gadget needs to have this little lump sticking out down to the bottom. So stick your swivel knife right in there and then use your screwdriver to tighten it down. Don't tighten it very much. This thing is plastic. It can break easily. Okay. Then you have another little screw here. We'll loosen that one eventually. And we're going to slide it in till I got about, oh, maybe 3 sixteenths of an inch. And we're going to tighten it down a little bit. Again, not overly tight. Make sure of that. Now, I'm going to grab some water. And I'm going to take this happy little piece of Herman Oak leather and get it wet. And another thing too, your swivel knife has to be sharp. So strop it first before you put it in here. All you do is run it right along the edge using this little collar as a guide and poof, 
or voila, whatever you want to say, you have an instant border on your belt. Of course, this is a little shorter, but this is a fast way to run a nice, even edge down both sides of a strap. And that's it. That's the whole deal. Thanks. So this is called a pro pedal. It's probably a little difficult to see, but uh, it's an Osborne tool, has a flat edge, and it is fairly sharp. And this tool is no different than other cutting tools in the sense that it needs to be sharpened. You can use your same little strop. You have to be careful. You just want to pull it one direction, and again, wipe any residue off that might be on there. Now you're ready to go. Okay, now we're going to actually start lifting up the pedals. Now, I'm going to take the pointy end of this tool, and I'm going to put it right down in the part of the leaf where the cut goes in. And I'm going to start pushing and just wiggling a little bit, and I'm going to move it back and forth. I'm actually cutting. Not a lot, but I'm cutting. Now keep in mind, the leather's wet. And that helps. Another thing that's helpful is the fact that this is a piece of Herman Oak leather. Nothing molds and stretches and works like Herman Oak. Now as we go around here and lift these pedals, you notice how I use this, my, my other fingers here, my other hand, to provide a base for what I'm doing. You work the tool back and forth, cutting and pushing down in as you go. Now the tool has a flat edge like we showed you earlier. That helps you to not go too deep. So you get it started work it in, going back and forth, and actually you can push this tool under the leather a long, long ways. You can really get carried away if you want to. Now, not everybody does, of course, but you can experiment with this tool and you'll be amazed at what you can do. There's other kinds of tools that will do the same thing, but mostly on a smaller scale. There's some stamping tools that are called undercut bevelers. And I believe B892, B60, B61 are those tools. They're more for use on smaller areas, perhaps a belt, something of that nature. You may have to stop every now and then. Sharpen your pro pedal or polish it up. Remember, you can slide it under, cutting through the leather just about as far as you want to go. Then you can come back and you can actually lift up. You really lift those, those pedals up. Just make sure the leather is wet enough to, to hold its shape. Now, you can probably see the amount of lift that you can attain. And with oak leaves, this is just a wonderful tool. You can make oak leaves really look good. You probably notice there's some uh, marks here on the leather where we entered the pedals. You can remove those to some degree with a modeling tool. You can re-bevel with a larger beveling tool. This small one probably won't do so great, but it does okay.
and you can see it helps quite a bit. A matting tool is actually better. That works really good. As a matter of fact, as long as we're doing this, maybe I'll just take the time to grab one of those tools. show you what a matting tool does. This is a very common matting tool. It's a lot like a beveler. Again, moisture content really helps a lot. And you can start to see what a tremendous difference using a matting tool can make. Now we've done half of it with this one. We're gonna do half with another one, just so you can see the effect. This is a P005, I believe. matting tool you can walk. Now if you remember all those little marks that the pro pedal left, they're all gone. Matting tool, this one really leaves a, a wonderful texture. You can extend that texture out away from your design. You just don't have to hit it as hard the farther you get away from the design. So, there's a couple tips. Hope you like them. Yeah. Hi. We've decided to do a little bit of a video on a sewing tip using seaming tape. What we're going to do is make a patchwork rug. Actually, we've made it kind of sort of, but we're going to add some to it. And if you've ever used a zigzag machine to try and patch things together, which maybe you haven't or maybe you have, you, you realize it can be a real pain and, well, it's a real pain. So we're going to show you how to make that a little bit easier. And Liz, our lovely assistant here, is going to demonstrate how this seam tape really work, work. I've got three little squares of hair on cow here that we've picked for our next row across the end of the rug. And we're going to have Liz put a couple of them together with a piece of seam tape. And what we've got to have is probably that one, those two together. The seam tape is unique. It sticks really pretty well. But for what it's worth, you can also pull stuff off of it and re-stick it, so it's real handy in that regard. So she's just cut a length off the roll. As you can see, put it onto one side of the, the piece. Now just lays another piece of cowhide right on top. Keep the, uh, the edges matched up pretty nice. It doesn't have to be perfect, because on a zigzag sewing machine, the zigzag automatically pulls the, the seam together as we go. Okay, one down. Might as well do the other one. That way she can get the seam tape on the larger piece of the already completed rug while I'm sewing them up. Perfect. Okay. Once we've trimmed off the ends of the, the tape, now we're going to sew them together. This is a, an industrial zigzag machine. It's made by a company called High Lead. And it's all set up to go. I'm just going to start my, my seam, hold the threads tight, and make half a dozen stitches, and then of course reverse it to get everything locked in. 
and then just let it go and you can see that the seam tape makes everything easy you don't have to fight and fuss and hold the parts together while you sew reverse it to lock everything in then cut off our threads, turned around, and we'll do the remaining seam. The zigzag sewing machine really makes it possible to do quite a few things. It's pretty good for patching together exotic remnants so that you can make a wallet, ba uh, wallet back or perhaps a clutch purse back or a handbag. They can be kind of a little pricey. The high lead here isn't too bad, but Sailrite makes a nice portable model that will actually do the same thing. Either of these machines are available from us if you absolutely have to have one. Okay, seam tape makes life easy. Now we're going to add this strip onto the end of our rug. And again, if, if your edges don't line up exactly perfectly, you can always kind of bunch things up just a little bit, and you, you just kind of have to make it work. And it does. Now it's a little harder sewing a piece of leather as large as this rug, but we're just going to roll it up put one half of it on the machine bed get things all ready to go get it underneath the foot uh, adequately so it'll start catching right away we'll make a few stitches and kind of just help it feed by hanging on to the bulk of the rug here. And basically you just have to let the machine do the work. And if I had a brain, I'd push this little lever down over here so that we're winding a bobbin as we sew. Nothing worse than having to stop, stop work to wind a bobbin. This is a pretty happy little machine. It just shovels right along. Get down to the end, we're going to put it in reverse. Reverse again. And there we are. We have another section added onto our rug. More to follow. Hi, I'm Kevin. This is a very, very short video that's intended for someone that is buying their very first leather sewing machine or considering buying it. Take this as someone who has already done that and committed all the stupid errors that they could commit. That would be me. So here you go. This is intended to save you some money 
and more importantly some grief. First of all, at this point for your first sewing machine it's not critical what you're buying. What is critical is who you're buying it from. Obviously I'd like you to buy it from me, but that's not practical. If you live far, far away and don't want to have a machine shipped to you, the biggest thing is buy your sewing machine from somebody that you trust. Preferably somebody that you know because you are going to need that person sooner or later, probably sooner. The only other thing really that I can give you, that I can tell you, if you buy a sewing machine, your first one, buy a, a new one, not a used machine. Now if you want to become a sewing machine mechanic, that's fine. Personally, I hate mechanical things. I look under a car and car hood and to me it's like spaghetti under there. I have no idea what to do. But if you're one of those people that looks at a machine and oh I know under how that works then buy a used sewing machine because you're going to become a sewing machine mechanic without fail. Another reason why you don't buy a used machine most of the time is because the older sewing machines came with a clutch motor. They didn't have servo motors like the modern machines today and they didn't have speed reducers on them. That's not true in every case, it's just true in most cases. So if you get a used machine that Uncle Billy Bob Joe had in his barn for 10 years and he used to upholster with it or sew canvas, more than likely you're going to get that $300 sewing machine home and find out that when you step on the little foot feed thingy, it goes shoom like a rabbit out of a hole. Now that's fine if you're upholstering or sewing canvas and if you're not scared to death of sewing machines. But when you're sewing leather, you want to be able to sew chunk, 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 chunk really slow. That's what a speed reducer will do for you. Now there's another consideration. Remember I told you, buy a machine with a, with a servo motor because that's what allows you to go slow, then make sure it has a speed reducer. A speed reducer is sort of a, a misnomer. It's a misleading term because really what a speed reducer does is provide torque at slow speeds. That means you can poke through three quarters to an inch of leather and not stop you can go dead slow and it'll just go right through that leather with no difficulty. If your machine only has a servo motor and no speed reducer, you'll go slow all right, but you'll come to a dead stop when you're sewing slowly because you don't have enough momentum build up on the needle and you don't have the torque that the speed reducer provides. So, buy a new machine and spend the money spend as, as much as you can spend in your budget because you get what you pay for with a machine, a sewing machine. And another thing about most of the newer sewing machines, they come with lifetime warranties, limited lifetime warranties. They won't warranty a spring, they won't warranty a needle or a needle bar, but they'll warrant all the inner workings of the machine and that's what you want. Now, remember the other thing when I said buy it from somebody you know or somebody you trust or at least somebody that you have a, a warm fuzzy feeling for because that's the kind of person that can show you what you need and he's not just going to try and sell you a machine so that you go out the door. We've actually had customers come in that want to buy a sewing machine and they want to spend seven or eight hundred bucks on a new portable machine but I'd just rather not sell it to them because I know it's not going to do what they want to do. I know they're going to take that machine home and try to sew a knife sheath on it. It's not a happening thing. One of the advantages of talking to someone with experience on sewing machines, and by the way, I don't mean experience about sewing machines, I mean experience about sewing leather on sewing machines. One of the advantages of that is that person probably knows what will work what won't work. 
He knows the difficulties that you're going to come up against and it'll be a happier experience for you. So, again, short video. Just remember this. Buy a new machine. If at all possible, spend the money. Buy it from someone that you trust. They will make sure you get what you need and not what they want to sell you. The next part of this video is going to deal with sewing machine issues. Now if you're a new person with a machine for the first time, then this will be helpful. If you're a guy that's had a machine for a long time, you don't use it all that often, maybe you're having some troubles, we're going to try and solve some of those things for you. So there you go. Happy sewing. Thanks. Hi, Kevin with Springfield Leather. I wanted to take a couple minutes and convey something to you as a, a vegetable tanned leather buyer. Something that is pretty smart and it's pretty good for you to know. You know with most things in life you've heard the saying you get what you pay for. Well that's true to a large degree but there's some instances where that's not true and one of them can be in the leather world. If you've ever tooled on a piece of veg tan leather more than one kind then you know what the differences are. But so we, we've noticed that we have a lot of customers that will buy a very expensive piece of leather and they feel that because they're spending more money it should be better for what they're doing. It's just simply not always true. A good example would be a double shoulder. Double shoulders are basically a they're kind of an, an off fall of the leather shoe sole industry. They use the bulk of that hide to make shoe soles and then they've got this double shoulder left over which happens to work really well for belts because of the shape. On the other hand you have sides of leather. They're not as as yield effective for belts but the leather can be really nice. So getting back to what I told you. You can buy a number one import double shoulder, very rectangular, square, pretty nice and pretty clean, and it can run you at the moment $6.99 a square foot. You can also buy a piece of Herman Oak leather in a side for $5.79 a foot at the moment. And that's as of the date of this video. Which one's better? the one you pay seven bucks a foot for or the one you pay five seventy nine for? The answer is it's the one you pay five seventy nine for. It tools better, it cuts better, it molds better, and it dyes better. Holster makers, for example, all over the world would prefer to use Herman Oak or perhaps another tanneries leather. But through inexperience, some folks assume that just because this piece of leather costs seven dollars a foot it's better than this one that costs five seventy nine just not true if you have questions it's a pretty good thing to call and talk to us we'll help you out